my lovely, lovely imps, the holidays are coming soon. In fact, one holiday is coming up tomorrow as of the recording of this video. The uploading might be a little bit later. So I apologize if this is a little too late for Thanksgiving, but it'll be just in time for the rest of the holidays. We gotta talk about something, my lovely imps, which is family arguments, specifically arguments with family over politics. Politics, politics, politics. You know, we talk about politics a lot on this stream. And I wanted to take a little bit of time, and this is going to be probably the first of multiple videos. We'll see how the, well, I'm going to gauge the interest and see how much people like it. But I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about what to do if you are a little baby imp and you go to a holiday gathering and a political argument begins and you don't want to be caught unawares. So I figured a little bit of a holiday argument briefing segment would probably be fairly valuable to my community. So that's what this is going to be. First things first, always remember that you are not obligated to uh, debate with your family about every single political topic that comes up. Um, uh, even though there are lots and lots of family members in everybody's family who are incredibly politically vocal, Nobody ever listens to the rule of never talk about politics or religion at the dinner table. No one. No one listens to it. Especially your uncle who watches a lot of Alex Jones. If you have an Alex Jones uncle out there, you will know that that motherfucker will be the first person dropping some political hot takes at the dinner table. You know that. You know it. Everybody, everybody's got one. There are a lot of relatives out there uh, who are particularly vocal about politics. And uh, it's not just the Alex Jones uncles anymore. It's not just the uncle who's ready to tell you about how um, switching back to the gold standard would be awesome because it would make sure that the alien greys can't control your Visa credit card anymore. It's not just them. Um, the MAGA movement as a whole over the last, you know, since 2016, um has been has has sort of had as a matter of culture this highly politically evangelical nature and so more and more people are encountering arguments with right-wing family members not just right-wing family members but a lot of right-wing family members at the holiday dinner table so that first rule is you do not you're not obligated to argue with them but i can also understand people's desire I come from a family uh, of people who loved to argue and hated to be argued with. It's a very weird dynamic, but I was somebody who always liked to argue with them. Um, and I'm sure that doesn't surprise you at all. Uh, so if you're like me and you want to be able to engage with and challenge some of these ideas, I wanted to lay out a couple of ground rules that can help you be more effective uh, at uh, discussing things at the family dinner table. So remembering rule one, which is that you're not obligated to engage. You do not have to. No matter how annoying your uncle is being, you don't got to engage if you don't want to. But if you do, let's talk about it. Rule number one, okay? Rule number one. Uh, you will never engage in a real debate of data and facts and figures at the family dinner table holiday type political argument. It will never happen. These will always be the most purely rhetorical uh, arguments that and emotional arguments that you ever encounter. No one is going to be sitting at the table looking to read a study Nobody is going to be sitting at the table, uh, you know, ready to verify your polling numbers. Uh, nobody is going to be sitting there ready to read a book that you recommend. So what you need to have on hand are arguments that are effective at jamming and challenging people's prejudices and emotional uh, rhetorical sensitivities. Um, and... 
And you should keep that in mind at all times. When you're at a family dinner type situation, your audience is the other people sitting there who are listening in on the conversation and perhaps hopping in at random moments while you and your, your, your MAGA uncle are going at it, okay? Nobody, like I said, nobody cares about the, the truth of numbers or anything like that. And that's a double-edged sword because that means that uh, if your uncle decides to pull a number out of his ass and say, 90% of people think this, um, you can turn that around on him. And you can go, dude, that's not true. You just made that number up. You don't got anything for that. And that's kind of a giga Chad argument to be able to do. If you know that no one here is ever going to like open up their phone and go check a number because nobody cares. You're not having an academic debate. If you're, if the person that you're arguing against starts randomly trying to say, well, this thing says this amount of numbers, you can call them on their bullshit and say, hold on a second. You're not, you don't have those numbers on hand. Let's talk about the logic here. Let's follow this through logically and you can get them to continue to engage on rhetoric. So keep that in mind. All right. Um, you are going to be, if you're engaging in these things, it is going to be highly emotional and it's going to be highly focused on rhetoric. And the most effective things that you can do is jam people's preconceptions, prejudices, and, uh, uh, and talking points. Um, a lot of people who are of the family dinner arguing type are ones who like to memorize things that they heard on Fox News. They like to memorize little talking points. Um, like, for example, um, uh, you, uh, like, something that you'll encounter a lot is, um, is from these types of people is half-remembered uh, things that Tucker Carlson said once. Um, and, uh, uh, and... <laughs> And if you can, if you can counter them on that, if you can call them as basically just pointing out that they're just sort of half remembering something from Tucker Carlson, you can make them look very silly. And often, if somebody starts to get embarrassed during a debate, that is the beginning of the end for them of this particular type of like family dinner table, uh, highly uncomfortable debate. If somebody starts to get embarrassed, if you point out. Um, hey, what the hell are you talking about? You just made that up, dude. Like, if they're like, oh, yeah, there's these, these drag queens are doing, their drag queens are doing sexual story hour. And you go, where'd that happen? Did that, did you make that up just now? Or do you, or, or, or did that actually happen somewhere? Did that happen here? Really? That happened here? Where? And you can ask them a question like that and they'll start to babble and the other people listening will hear that very quickly. If somebody starts to um, get uh, out of their depth, which they always do, it's incredibly easy to just call somebody on it and go, that didn't happen. You can't, you don't even know where that fucking happened. Tell me where that happened. And they'll go, well, I don't know. I saw it on Fox News. And you go, do you believe everything that you hear on Fox News? Do you ever like look into that or do you just like listen to whatever anybody tells you? And then you can, you can be like, oh, I read this on the internet too. I read that, uh, I read that money grows on trees and then they look like a fool. So like I said, a lot of the struggle is going to be purely emotional and purely rhetorical. And part of that is remembering not to get lost in the weeds and to call people on the fact that they're not likely citing anything seriously. Fox news literally made stuff up today. Many such cases. Yeah, it's really easy to do. Um, especially right now, if you're in mixed company, like if you're with an entirely conservative family, um, like, you know, you're probably not going to get anybody who's going to be on your side. They might get angry and embarrass themselves. Um, but if you're in like mixed company, if you're like, if there are d Democrats in your family who are listening in, they all know that Fox news is full of shit. So if you point out that your uncle just probably heard some random crap from a rant that Tucker Carlson or Alex Jones did, they're immediately going to roll their eyes and side with you, like instantly. You will have won that 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 gambit. Um. Yeah. Another thing, um, is to uh uh is to is of course to be aware of the topics that people are most likely to get angry about this year. 
Um, and also to recognize that that may leave them open to weaknesses on other topics that might not be in their memory. Something to know about conservatives in particular, this is true about everyone, but conservatives in particular, the conservative news cycle is incredibly, incredibly tight. They forget almost immediately about the thing that they were last mad about the moment that the conservative uh, talking heads tell them to start being mad about something new. Um, so, for example, most of them don't remember any of their talking points about uh, that they would bring up when Democrats would criticize them about the fact that Donald Trump was mass torturing children on the border. And if you were to bring that up, you were like, you can, you can literally just, you can just go wild on that. If you remember anything about the, uh, the border situation under Trump, they won't know how to respond to that at all. And you can just be like, you didn't do anything. You didn't care when uh, Donald Trump was was separating uh, families en masse. They, you didn't give a shit. You sat there and looked the other way while he was torturing literal children. And then they look really stupid. Yeah, remember when they were mad about M&Ms? They don't even remember that. There might be one exception to this rule, which is that they're still really mad about Dylan Mulvaney. But that's also really funny. If you have a family member who starts getting super mad about Dylan Mulvaney, it's extremely easy to point out that they're being ridiculously cringe. Honestly, I think trans issues are like um, it, one of the easiest to engage on at this particular point in time. And the reason for that is because um, you can just point out that no one cares about Republicans derangement on trans issues and you can also point out that all like that nearly all of the republican candidates who hyper fixated on trans people lost their elections because even republicans don't care about their derangement about trans people um a pillow says also if i may say people should p play into civility the whole don't talk religion politics or money uh, socially sh shame them for disturbing the peace. Um, you don't always have to do that, um, but it can be effective, especially if they're getting particularly mad. If and especially if they're getting like um, racist or sexist or transphobic. If they're doing anything prejudiced, it's really easy to get them on that point to basically be like, everybody here was having a good time until you started freaking out about your obsession with. Jewish people, trans people, black people, whatever. Um, that is definitely for, for real. Um, uh, and of course, yes, I do agree that staying calm is incredibly, incredibly important. If you're the one who stays calm in a family argument, you will, you will basically win in the eyes of everyone else almost 100% of the time. Um, and it's incredibly, incredibly easy uh, to maintain your calmness so long as you remember that. If you remember the fact that staying calm in these types of conversations is your winning point. Um, now, of course, there are timed times for impassioned speeches, but you really have to know your audience and be prepared for that. And most of the time, if you're engaging with a family member who's going off on a tear, that's not the time and place. You want to come, come off as the cool, calm, and collected one. You want to remember that this is somebody who's basically freaking out about X political issue, a political issue that in all likelihood the rest of your family does not care as much about. And if you basically challenge them from a position of calmness and ask them questions and they continue to get mad, which they often do because they're extremely passionate about that issue, you will have a massive advantage and other family members will be more willing to open up and listen to you. So... As a quick review, our first long rule is all of these conversations are about rhetoric and emotions. Always keep that in mind when you're engaging or have found yourself stuck in a family argument. That the cold hard facts rarely matter. And that brings us to rule number two, which is when the facts do matter and can be used to your advantage. When you're engaging in a family dinner table type argument, um, the only type of fact that can be 
to your advantage is one that is damn near impossible to argue with, or one where arguing with it will make them look like a fool. An example of this is the amount of children who have been killed in Palestine. That's an issue that's likely to come up a lot at a lot of people's dinner, dinner tables uh, this uh, holiday season. And one of the things that you can say very easily with an incredible amount of confidence is that a lot of children have died in Palestine and that it's been verified not just by Palestinian authorities, but by the UN, that you would have to be a genuine conspiracist to argue with the absurd amount of children's deaths that have been caused uh, in this recent conflict. And that's something that a lot of people uh, may encounter family members attempting to do, is basically downplaying the number of deaths. But it's almost, it's almost inarguable. And it's very easy when you have a fact like that on your side, which is so difficult to argue against, for you to basically be like, you're telling me that you and your internet blogs know more than the UN does? You're telling me that the UN is secretly lying when the UN has already, by and large, uh, overall, uh, basically refused to take action on Israel? You're telling me those guys are making things up? Um, and it makes them look like they're talking out of their ass. There are times where you can do that. Another example is on uh, trans issues. If you get a family member who's going off on a rant about trans people taking over the country, you can go, listen, the highest estimates show that about 1% of the population at maximum is trans. You're telling me that I'm supposed to be freaked out and panicking about the takeover because 1% of the American population might be trans and then they go well yeah blah, 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 and then they sound like crazy to everybody so there are times where uh facts and figures can be useful but only when they are not going to be uh like they're not going to lead into some gigantic dispute over uh over facts and figures an example of this is um how uh people would uh when people used to argue about COVID a lot with their relatives, people would get um, distracted arguing about individual COVID counts. And that's a huge mistake. Um, in fact, there's a debate that I have on my channel where I show exactly how a conservative might try to derail a conversation by trying to hyper fixate on uh, basically unprovable numbers and how to deal with it. And in this particular situation, they basically bring out a fact and figure. They're like, yeah, you know, there was a bunch of, there was 80 people in New York who were actually motorcycle deaths. And they said they were COVID deaths. Um, and I said, okay, so let's say that that's true. Where, how do you make up for all the other people? Take 80 off the count. And that's a situation where... If you got distracted and tried to go in and that go, well, no, it wasn't actually 80. It was closer to this or that. You would get distracted and nobody cares. No one's going to actually go look up those numbers. So if you instead go, dude, what are you talking about? Take your 80 off the number. Take 80. Take 100. Take 1,000 if you want. Let's pretend that 1,000 people weren't actual COVID deaths. Look at the numbers. They're crazy, my man. You sound like a crazy person. You win. Bam. Never... Uh, when you're at a dinner table debate like this, never ever let a conspiracy theorist get you off into uh, a pointless argument where he's trying to measure facts and figures and, uh, uh, and, and, and because they always will have the advantage because they're instilling doubt. They're doing that whole do your own research thing. And remember that. So rule number one, rhetoric is king. Emotions are king in dinner table debates. It's just how it goes, okay? Rule number two, if you if there are if there is a need to invoke facts and figures, make sure they're the most rock solid ones you can get. Don't don't try and get involved in a uh in a uh a slicing off numbers contest, okay? Just don't do it. It's it's terrible. Yeah, exactly. As Killjoy 40k points out, uh even the most even conservatives own estimates of how many people passed away from covid still have it as the worst 
um, pandemic in modern history. That's a point that you can make that completely avoids anybody having to turn their brain off and go, I'm not going to go read some report from the FDA about some stupid bullshit. It's Thanksgiving dinner. I got turkey in my belly. You never want to engage on that, okay? Number three. Um, <laughs> don't, uh, uh, don't underestimate the value of simply pointing out <laughs> how somebody sounds, okay? If you have an uncle who starts rambling about, I don't know, crime rates or um or covid or 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 fda uh uh translucent coffins or uh uh that wasn't the fda that was the other one that was the uh the that was the other one fema that was the fema death camps thing um or any of these other things it's very easy to be tempted to actually engage with those conversations but keep in mind they're not engaging in a sense of good faith. They're trying to sound like they have a secret knowledge that other people don't have. And you can deflate that uh, by basically just saying, what the hell are you talking about, dude? That's, 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 off, that's off the cuff. Why are, you, why are you jumping onto this weird fixation? And, um, and why are you making the rest of us deal with it? This is something that we touched about in the previous thing where I said that like, the disturbing the piece that a pillow brought up the third thing is yeah don't underestimate the ability to deflate a topic that is uh genuinely off the chain <laughs> kildress says go low ask if they want water and imply that they're drunk i don't recommend doing that okay no don't do that don't do that okay no uh that's that's rule number four okay uh, uh don't insult people okay i know that it can be tempting don't insult people. Do not, do not get up on your high horse and pretend that you're a debate streamer. That is the absolute do not, okay? Number, rule number four is a do not. Don't do that, okay? Don't. Whatever you do, don't do that. Even if they're insulting you, don't do it, okay? I'm serious. Do not do that. And I know that it's tempting, but... You will almost you will almost guaranteed fail in a family debate type situation if you are the first person to throw an insult. And I'm not talking about saying, um, uh, uh, I'm not talking about saying, hey, that's your own fixation. Don't bring that shit here because that's not an insult. I'm saying don't call them. Uh, let me think of some of the gr the greatest moments in a debate in debate history don't call them low iq don't call them a a a, a wojack or or anything like that don't call them an npc um don't call them the arsler uh don't do any of that keep all of that don't call them fat definitely don't do that okay none of it don't call them a dumb fuck don't do it none of it keep it very far away okay just keep it really far away and even yes as a pillow says, don't call them an incel. Definitely don't do that. Don't do that. Even if they are, don't do it. And um, this is all. This is especially true if you're dealing with Christians. Um, Christians have a massive persecution complex, and in a family situation, uh, they will win if they get to feel like a victim. Don't do it. Let them insult you first. Okay and be like a duck and let it just roll off your back. If they insult you first, they will lose the rest of the family's, uh, the rest of the family's support because they will have broken family decorum, okay? So rule number four is uh, <laughs> don't, don't pretend that you're watching a debate stream because it's not the same rules, okay? In a debate stream, when I'm debating with some random nobody Nazi on the internet, okay? And I call them a dumb fuck. That's a good, that's because first of all, I've generally earned it by proving that they are indeed a dumb fuck. And secondly, there's some random nobody. Okay. They don't, they're not family that you have to see again. And everybody here also knows that. Okay. So don't do it. All right. Do not do it. It will not go well. Do not in, do not get, 
Do not try to style on your family members if you are engaged in one of these debates. Okay? Rule number five, okay? Rule number five, all right? So rule number one is rhetoric and, rhetoric and emotion are king. Rule number two is if you have to talk about facts and figures, stick to rock solid facts and figures. Rule number three is if you can debate, if you can deflate the topic, uh, do it. Which is basically to say, if your your uh, uh, Alex Jones family member starts rambling off about uh, about uh, some topic that is incredibly esoteric, it's okay for you to basically be like, dude, that's really weird, and nobody here knows what you're talking about. Can we talk about something real? You could basically undercut the value of the topic. And rule number four is don't ever insult first. Never be the first to insult. And if you can avoid it, do not insult in return. If you can be as Christ-like as possible and let them insult you, you will likely win. Okay? And rule number five, and this will be the final rule for right now on this particular segment. Rule number five is remember the goal. Okay? And that's really important. Okay. The goal when you are involved in a family, uh, in a in a family dinner table type political debate, is not to own your opponent to get views on the internet. It is not to uh, uh, it is not to uh, uh, convince your individual relative uh, uh, that they are right or wrong. Um, but rather, if you're stuck in that situation, and this is most of the time, it might, it might be, I will say there's a small chance that you might actually be trying to convince your relative to think about things differently. That's a possibility. Usually it's not though. Usually if you find, find yourself in one of these, it's because one of your family members has gone off on a tear about politics and you're like, Jesus Christ, I need to shut this down or I need to provide an alternative view. And you have to remember that. Your job is to basically make their view, whatever heinous view they have, uh, make their view seem less credible to the rest of the family members who are sitting there listening or perhaps even participating. And you have to keep that in mind, that basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to inoculate the other family members from a particularly dangerous talking point. And the reason why I say this, people are going to be like, what do you mean? You're not really trying to convince your family member? You might be. It is true. There are some circumstances where you might literally be trying to, but most of this has been geared at dealing with the uh, the MAGA Trumpster family members that are going around evangelizing Trump stuff. And those people have, uh, if they're still doing that at this point, chances are they're not going to be convinced, which means that what you're trying to do is basically convince the rest of your family that you don't want to be that guy. That's it. That's what your entire goal is. You're basically trying to have the rest of the family come to the conclusion, ooh, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be, I, that guy sounds bad to me. It leaves a bad taste in my mouth and I don't want to be that guy. And the reason I say this comes from a position of experience, okay? When I was, uh, when I was younger, like I said, my family loved to argue at dinner time and hated to be argued with. And I had a couple of family members who all had pet issues. And a lot of them were particularly, um, particularly uh, 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 dangerous, in my opinion. I had a family member who was incredibly racist. Um, and they would go on tears on racist tirades. Um, and my goal whenever I engaged with that family member was basically to make sure that none of my other family members thought that that was an, that they were, they had any credibility whatsoever that they wanted to, that, that every other family member who was listening in on that conversation, who was sitting around and watching it happen, which is most of the family members where this type of stuff happens, that they walked away going, I don't ever want to be like that. That was a really bad showing. That made me feel uncomfortable. I would much rather be on the position that doesn't act like that. And I think that that is what a lot of people are going to encounter. 
uh, especially considering that the the prime rule, the rule above all other rules that I stated is that you do not have to engage in these types of arguments. So what I'm talking about generally is the arguments that are unavoidable or are so heinous that you do not want to avoid them because you feel like it could do damage to your family. Um, and I do think it's important because uh, I do think that uh, sometimes uh, certain vocal family members can act as points of radicalization where they go on unhinged emotional tears uh, and convince other people that that's okay to behave that way. Yep. So uh, rule number five is keep your eye on the prize. Remember what your goal is. Uh, your goal is most likely in most cases not going to be to individually convince that family member to stop being a trump supporter but rather to show to the rest of the family that trump supporting is a bad look that it's a bad position to be in um that it makes you look bad that it makes you uh that other family members will not enjoy being around you if you're that type of person uh, that the opinions are bad and shouldn't be, that, that you will be the embarrassing one. Um, and that all ties back to rule number one. Rule number five, destroy them in public amidst the marketplace of ideas. I mean, it is kind of like that. That's how these arguments go. And you have to keep in mind that, that that's the, that's the, that's what these, that's what your opponents are most likely to be at a, at a family dinner table conversation. At a family dinner table conversation, the person who's most likely to debate with you is a uh, is somebody who's hyper opinionated on a topic, and they basically want they want other people to yuck along with them. They want people to be like, "Yeah, <laughs> here's my racist idea, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right." That's the opinions that you're going to most commonly encounter, um, or you're going to opinion, or you're going to encounter somebody basically doing cheerleading for their favorite. Um, political candidate who might be a serial criminal and fascist like Donald Trump, where I think it's pretty important to maintain uh, a defensive line against that type of thing. Yeah. So um, I don't think I have any other uh, uh, specific like or any other general rules of the family debate situation right now. Um, but basically, again, just to go through them all again, rhetoric is always gonna be the most important. Rhetoric and emotions are central to any family dinner table type debate that you find yourself locked in. Uh, rule number two, uh, if you get stuck on facts and figures, make sure that you're sticking only to the ones that you can that you can basically absolutely that are as rock solid as possible, okay? And never let them pivot you off onto some stupid nitty gritty argument because at that point they're just wasting your time. Uh, rule number three um, is uh, don't be afraid to deflate the the value of the conversation topic if somebody is going off on a topic that's particularly heinous. It is okay for you to say, dude, nobody cares about that. Why are you going on a rant about this? What makes you think that it's okay um, to, uh, uh, to, to, to like start bringing up this weird racial crap or this weird uh, whatever crap? Why, what, what makes you think that's okay? That's a fair thing to do. You can totally deflate that. Number four, don't insult people and always maintain your calm. Uh, and, uh, so remember that don't insult people, maintain your calm. You should be in the calm position. And then of course, uh, rule number five is keep your eye on the prize. Uh, you're not making a video for internet views and you're not personally trying to convince your Trump uncle to not vote for Trump anymore. What you're trying to do is, uh, seem credible, more credible than the Trump uncle to all of your other aunts and uncles and cousins and other family members that are there, okay? Um, those are the general rules. And of course, to bookend it once again, just to be sure, uh, you're not obligated to engage in these conversations and you should generally avoid them, but they're not always avoidable. I've been there myself. Uh, sometimes you go to a big family dinner uh, your uncle gets a couple drinks in him and thinks it's a great time to convince people that Donald Trump actually didn't do anything wrong.
Yep. Yeah. Don't be a debate, bro. Yeah, obviously that one's under the no insulting rule. I hope I hit everything. Um, that was basically off the cuff from my experience. A couple of quick rules that people can remember um, that you could probably memorize and, and take with you after watching this video. Um, <laughs> Number six, bring up Monty Python skits. It worked with my uncle. Yeah, maybe. Maybe, maybe that would, maybe that would work. I hope that advice helps you. I was actually thinking about whether or not it would be valuable to do, you know, topic by topic argument stuff. Um, but I don't feel like I'm like I have everything on hand to do that. I did prepare some. I actually took some notes on stuff to talk about with Israel Palestine specifically because I feel like that's going to be one that comes up at the table a lot. And I guess I just the reason why. <laughs> I feel this I feel a slight need to defend myself at the moment when I'm giving people the tools to fight with their family members. Um but uh <laughs> but listen, I had to deal with that a lot growing up, okay? And it wasn't always escapable. Sometimes it was actually inescapable. Um I don't I I I feel like I did a good enough job telling people that they should probably try to avoid fights with com with family members, but um I personally would rather have people feel uh, capable and enabled to be able to stand their own at a, if they get uh, into a family confrontation than to feel the like sort of pain of having to sit there while your drunk uncle goes off on a ridiculously racist rant and your young impressionable cousins are sitting there becoming more racist because your uncle is going on a racist rant. Do you see what I'm talking about? Do you see what I'm talking about? Do you see, do you see why? See what, yeah, so I hope you guys can understand where I'm coming from. Uh, I, I don't generally think that it's a good idea uh, to, to fight with your family members. Um, that's why I said don't be a debate bro. Don't, pre don't try to pretend that you're a debate streamer because you're not. Even if you are a debate streamer, you're not in that moment. But, uh, but yeah. Lauren X Pandamus, how to debate your family on Israel Palestine? Don't. Um, I do think that there's a way to debate your family on Israel Palestine, but it's a it's going to be a particularly difficult issue, and I think that one of the things that is going to be, actually, here's a great thing. One of the things that is most important if Israel Palestine comes up is to focus on humanity, and I mean that to focus on the humane angle. It will it appeals to the most people. The vast majority of your family members are going to respond to arguments that fixate on humanizing the victims of the situation, which is to say, guys, it's not okay that this many children have died. It's not okay. That is a horrible thing, and we should be against it. It is, it's okay to be scared of terrorism. It's okay to be scared of lots of things, but it is not okay to look the other way at children being killed. In the last two months, f over 5,000 children have been killed uh, b uh, by, by the war that's being declared against Gaza, a, a large, a civilian population. That's not okay. And it's, and that will stick with people. They will, that sort of argument is, seems very simple, but it makes people go, dude, wait, actually, I don't want to, I don't want to support children dying. I'm not okay with that. That's a bad thing. And it also puts you in the position where if somebody else starts being crazy about it, um, like if they're like, well, they shouldn't have done a terrorism then. You go, you think kids did the terrorism? And then your uncle goes, well, n well, no, but their parents did. And then you go, so you think that kids should be punished because of the actions of their parents? And they go, well, you, you know, I don't know, well, you know what? Shut the fuck up. You don't know anything about the world. You're just a you're just a kid. And then you go, okay, like the kids that died in Gaza that you just said that you were okay with. And they go, I didn't say that. I didn't fucking forget it. Let's go eat some turkey. That's like how 90% of the conversations are going to go if you remember these rules, okay? And everybody else who was watching that will basically go, oh shit, I don't want to be the kid, I don't want to be the kid death person. 
I really don't want to be the kid death person. I'm going to think twice before I fly off the handle about that shit. I'm going to end this little segment with a little anecdote, okay? Um... I want to I want to tell you guys an anecdote, okay? Just so you guys understand that I know where you're coming from, okay? When I was younger, this was like when I was just out of high school. My aunt went on a extremely racist rant randomly at a family dinner. It wasn't even a Thanksgiving dinner. It was just a normal family dinner. And I argued back with her. And, um, I argued with her, uh, pretty strongly. And she said, uh, she got incredibly, incredibly angry, um, and started shouting about how I didn't respect my elders and that I didn't have the experience to know the truth. And I said, um, and I was pretty, this was a pretty catty response, but it was effective at the time which was, I said that, um, I, I literally said, I think that, um, respect is earned and I don't think that being racist deserves respect. Um, and she got so mad. I'm not even kidding you. You guys ever seen the scary Bilbo from Lord of the Rings? Um, this face right here. My aunt made the scary Bilbo face and unironically put her hands around my neck. I'm not kidding you. I'm not joking. That actually happened. She, and then other family members, she realized that other family members were watching and she tried to laugh it off. She was just like, ah, sometimes I want to kill you. And the other family members were sitting there going, it was done, okay? It was over. That, it ended it. She lost so hard, like it was done, all right? She could not save it from that moment. She absolutely lost her shit because I said that she was being racist and that I didn't respect that. And it, it didn't matter at that point. It didn't even matter if she even had... She could have had the best argument ever, but she lost in the eyes of the family in that moment because she got so angry that she almost choked me. No shit, but that must have been scary. I will say it was not scary. And the reason why it didn't, I mean, it, it shocked me, but it didn't scare me. And the reason why it didn't scare me is because um, my aunt is incredibly physically weak and clearly had a complete gamer moment. And I just sat there and was like, what, like, you couldn't choke me even if you tried. Like, like, what are you fucking thinking? <laughs> I know that that's funny to say, I know that it sounds funny, uh, Uncle Gumball. Uncle Gumball's like, it didn't scare me because I could take her, but I'm not kidding you, okay? Like, she was much older than me and not in the best health, okay? It's, uh, it's a messed, I have a messed up family, so... I ended with this deranged story so that I, I can say uh, there's a reason why I want to equip people to be able to stand on their own in a political debate that you're trapped in at Thanksgiving, okay? All right? Especially if it's on something heinous like racism, war hawking, uh, 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 more racism, uh, ridiculous out, out, uh, deranged transphobia, uh, all that kind of stuff, okay? All of that stuff, I want you to be able to have the basic tools and these rules in mind. So if you're going into it and you're expecting that you're going to have a family member try and pin you into an argument, review the video and also brush up on the topic a little bit. If you know there's a family member who's got a weird topic that they tend to argue about, go look up some facts. Go look up some some. Not not facts and figures like I, I don't want to contradict my own I I information, but go look up, go refresh yourself on the topic. You don't want to have like a bunch of like, excuse me, did you know that this, that, and the other thing? But you want to know the thing. You want to be familiar with the topic. Anyway, that's all I got to say. If this was valuable to you, make sure that you press like below and make sure that you're subscribed.
to Demon Mama because subscribing to me is amazing and makes you smarter and more based and you'll have a good time. We're about to do something very fun. We're about to do a big old debate review, which will also plug into this topic because one of the things that you're likely to debate with a lot of family members about this year, especially if you're in a liberal family, is about Joe Biden. So if you're ready to do a debate review, stay tuned, okay?